the alert. Some announcements and some to those on our prayer list. Remember that uh, Wednesday we have a midweek Bible study, and then uh, next Sunday is a church picnic uh, at our house, and uh, we invite you to that. Bring your lawn chair and just come and enjoy it. We'll have a nice evening together. Any other announcements? What do you need? They probably should bring food too. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's the admission ticket. It is. Okay, let's sing a couple songs, whatever Stephen has there, then we'll study something together. Hi, friend. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Number one. Give me pretty quickly while uh, Tigger was giving his sermon this morning. Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high, the sky is overshadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Not that we perish, how 
Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day.
uh, apprehensive about her first flight, but the genie said she saw something on Facebook and said it was great. So I'm glad to hear that. Hey, let's start this evening. I don't know how to uh, summarize what is on my mind exactly um, in deriving some of the benefit that I have from this study that we had in the sermon this morning. But let me let me start by asking tonight, and I don't I don't know who to pick on. Um, I'm going to try to guess our three eldest here, and uh, I'm going to say maybe Dick and Don, uh, Don and, and maybe Nellie. So you three begin Christ for a while, as you all three have been. Do you feel like you've uh, do you feel like you've reached the pinnacle of your studies? Do you feel like you've studied the Bible enough? Don, you weren't here this morning, so this might catch you flat-footed. Or do you think you've still got a ways to go? Do you think you have arrived? Um, comments from you three? Don says he's got a long way to go himself. Dick? Sorry, attitude when we look at the scriptures. 
And I think it's a good thing that we come upon scriptures that we don't immediately understand. God has given us a lifetime of learning in these pages. You know, if it was something you just read and set down, God knows us. We would easily drift away from it. But I always looked at each page as like a, a, a door. You're opening up to a room, and you put the light on, and you look at everything that's in there. It's good. And you move on to another room. And if you, if you don't understand, and I, there's stuff I don't understand, I don't get discouraged about it. I just okay, I have to dig in deeper. I have to learn more of what God is trying to tell me. Good comment. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to feel like if I could have just been there and been with Jesus, instead of having to just read this from afar, we don't realize what a benefit we have that many of the all of the early Christians did not have this completed text of Scripture. But one reason I laid out the first part of Mark the way I did this morning, uh, we often say with a little bit of tongue in cheek that if it would have been up to us to choose 12 apostles, none of them would have qualified. You know, we look over them and we would have said from the beginning, they're not, they're not up to I started to say up to snuff. I don't know where that came from. Um, probably from my my grandpa and finger dip snuff for probably 70 or 80 years. I don't even know what that means. They're not up to snuff. <laughs> what does that mean? They're not not up to a high standard. Jan, what does it mean to be not up to snuff? You're not up to high. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's the same back up the way one more time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these apostles would not have been qualified, and, and if we would have chosen these, or if we would have been able to, if Jesus would have said, what do you guys think, you know, church, what Lord on these, we would have said, ah, if you choose these guys, put them on a short leash, leash and don't, don't, you know, don't put, it, don't put up with too much from them, because we don't think they're going to make it. Jeannie and then Vicky. Well, it's not just the apostles. If you, if you look into the lives of uh, the major um, characters in the Bible, I mean, I don't know. I think Joseph was pretty, uh, I'm not going to say flawless. I mean, he, he seemed like kind of a brat when he was a kid in a way. Because, but um, he, he grew up, out, grew out of it pretty and good. Then, and then there was Daniel, but boy, you know, like from Noah to David to Saul to, yep. um, obviously Adam and yeah, so Isaiah, I, I mean, uh, Isaac and I'm Abraham. not meaning to pick on the apostles, I'm just reflecting on our comments this morning. If we would have, if we would have chosen those, and then we had these boat experiences with them, we would have probably sent them their walking papers, uh, if I was Jesus. You know, that would have, the third time would have been strike three, you're out. You know, you, just, you guys just don't, you can't cut it. Vic, your comment? Well, we can. Oh, so how can I put this? By God choosing the lowly, yeah. we can have confidence in that. God chose the imperfect to show us the perfect. Yeah. So none of us should say, well, I'm not good enough to do this, or I'm not good enough to do that. There's something we all can do. And we can look back through the history of the Bible with all those people that we would deem unqualified, that God had a significant impact in their lives. And they can do the same for us. That we, you know, we don't have, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a PhD in something, so I can't do it. You know, but when it comes to Christ, I think he's showing us that it's open to all of us, that we never can say to ourselves, we're just lowly, we'll never meet the standard, we'll never be up to snuff. Uh, that was what I was trying to say this morning when I commented about how this little two-part study is really encouraging to me, because uh, if Jesus was willing to deal with these guys, and, and I'm not putting myself above them, 
I'm just saying we can see, you know, it scares me to death to think anybody would write all, all about me following Jesus and then have the world be able to read it. So we, we sympathize with what we're doing to the apostles here and critiquing them. But uh, if Jesus is willing to tolerate them and to put up with them and to be patient with them, the song Stephen chose tonight blended beautifully with that idea. Um, it is so wonderful to know that you're near to the heart of God in spite of whatever flaws you might have. Don? I think Jesus looked at them as somebody that uh, he knew that he couldn't mold somebody that was really straightforward. They had a, a, a mind of their own. They were very smart. So he, he, he took people that he knew that he could write a piece of clay and he mold them. It's really hard to reshape arrogance sometimes. I, I've often said in studies with people, the, the people that you most delight to study with, well, let me say it the other way, the people you cringe about studying with are those who think they know it all. And those who think they've got it all figured out. Because with them, you almost have to deconstruct before you can construct. But when you run into somebody that's almost like a blank slate, and I don't mean by that that they're a zombie or something, but they don't have all these uh, uh, prefabricated thoughts and doctrines and all that that you have to deal with. They just want to say, feed me the scripture. That's a delight when you run into that. And they're just like a sponge. Maybe that's like a little child. My second question is a kind of a follow-up to that. Not, not only do you, uh, the first one is, do you ever feel overwhelmed by the Bible? And who among us wouldn't? It's so deep and so vast. And it takes, it, it will take us our lifetimes to keep studying it. The second one is, do you ever feel un, unqualified to be a disciple? And fortunately, I think we have enough sense and enough Bible sense to know that Jesus calls us just as we are. So we're, we're, we're confident or we're comfortable in coming to him and laying our lives out and say, God, I'm not much, but if you can work with me, I, I, want, to, I want to follow you. My second big question, and I've got five of them, and I don't know if we'll get through all of them. This one will go fast. When these apostles were first called, let's go back to that Mark chapter 1, verse 16 and following. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees Peter and Andrew and calls them. And then he sees James and John and calls them to follow. When these apostles, at least these first four, were first called, do you think they had any, mag any idea of the magnitude of what they were going after? They had to know something just to drop everything. They had to know something about Jesus. Yeah, I, I was even thinking about Zebedee, his two boys abandoned their father and left him with the hired servants. And you would have thought the father would have said, I am not going to allow you two guys to go foolishly. So they must, there must have been some measure of counting the cost, but to, to um, I feel bad for Nick. Is he, is he, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's waiting for somebody to, maybe Haley's due here, but he's got the two boys. It looks like he's doing okay though. I guess we would count him as a ten. <laughs> Nick and two boys wandered in the parking lot during the lesson. Stay focused. Uh, so what was I saying? You're having a senior moment, Terry. You're too young. I'm distracted here. <laughs> yeah, 70. So they knew something, Vic's right. But but you you don't. You never know when you start your journey what all it's going to entail. And maybe that's a blessing in disguise. Because if we did, if we knew every obstacle and every hurdle that we're going to have to overcome the day we were baptized, we may never go into the watery grave. It may just talk about overwhelming us. Jeannie? You know, I always, if you ever see uh, movies about war, 
um, old movies and um, the young men that are excited to go to war, um, it could be any of, of our wars that were excited to sign up, you know, from Civil War. I'm thinking of movies, just movies that I've seen. And I always think, oh man. They, it, they were clueless, really. Right. They, they knew that they wanted to do something for their country and they were... And they even knew, I think, that it might cost their life. I mean, you... But they had... They're, they could not ever have known what the kind of things they would see, the kind of experiences they were going to have in battle or whatever. I mean, I think it's kind of like that. Good, good illustration, good parallel. Anybody else on that? All right, here's another question for us. Do, do you find comfort in the patience that Jesus displayed with his disciples? This goes back to the sermon with the boat, you know, where Jesus says, that, how long are you going to be hardened and not understand? Do you, do you not, don't you, you don't get it? You know, what were all of those uh, statements that he made when they were in the boat? Do, does it, do you find, like me, a sense of comfort in the way Jesus deals with them? Would you have rather he boxed their ears or reprimanded them or put them on probation or, uh, uh, you know, said, I think I'm going to choose a, sec a second group and see if we can do better with them because you first 12 guys aren't doing too well? Is it wrong to derive a good? That, we're not trying to use that to justify our own shortfalls. That's a distorted uh, image of, of grace. But when we do read Jesus in the Gospels and the way he interacted, especially with his own disciples, we, we marvel at the grace that he extended to them. And how can that not come back to us and, and buoy us to realize if Jesus was patient with them, he's going to be patient with me. And I, I've titled this discussion tonight, again, uh, Works in Progress. And we all are that. We're, we're all, none of us are finished. But thank God that he is willing to be patient with them. And as we read and study those scriptures, and not only those, but, you know, when Paul um, writes about a, a time of falling away in the first century, he he goes back to the Old Testament. He said all of those stories were written for our, meaning the first century, our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So much of what was recorded, as Jeannie said, the stories of David and Daniel and Noah and all of that, it's real history. It's not made up. It's not fabricated. But part of the goal of it would be to, to teach future generations. This is the God you're dealing with, and, and you surely see that, and that's part of Paul's point there is don't you don't you fall away. God, God loves you and God is patient with you, but you stay strong. Who had their hand up? Gene. Uh, I think it might be tempting to get a little too comfortable with the fact that God so or that Jesus is so patient with us. But the other side of that to me is that we're supposed to be like Jesus. And here, the sunless, uh, the sinless son of God was so patient over and over again. And but I'm not, you know. What right do we have to be impatient with um, our fellow Christians and our family members? Uh, when we have so many shortcomings ourselves. I thought about that uh, incident in the, the boats when I was studying this week on that, and I kept thinking about a little every once in a while I click on the Browns website to see what's up to date, and uh, they they had uh, they had dismissed Corey Coleman because he had a cocky attitude. This is his third year. And he, just isn't panning out. So they just sent him, shipped him off. 
And then the guy that was uh, going to replace Corey Coleman, Antonio Callaway, is that the name? Stephen, you're a Steeler fan, you know. <laughs> so they were grooming him, and this guy was showing great promise and everything, and then he got stopped for a traffic ticket, and there was some kind of marijuana in his car. And he didn't tell the cops <coughs> until they found out later and confronted him. And the punishment for this rookie receiver, I, I had never heard of this before. They made him play the whole game, or as much of it. He kept asking, let me, let me come out. I, I, you know, a lot of times receivers will run a long pass and they'll get winded and they'll say, <laughs> replace me. And the coach, uh, the offensive coordinator and the coach were united on this. They said, no, stay in, you stay in. That was his punishment. They said, you, you do two things. You can sit him down and say, you behave badly and you're not playing in this game. Or you can just put him out there and say, we're going we're gonna to wear you out. And, and you'll remember this day for the rest of your life because you're going to be gasping for your last breath of air, but you're staying in the game. And I, I, I kept thinking about that. If I would have been Jesus in the boat, I would, I would have probably said, hey, you two guys swim back to shore. You're out of the boat. You know, you, you have disqualified. You're not in it anymore. But Jesus is so patient. And follow-up questions there. Um, he never told him, you're too slow. Go back to square one and don't ever think about being an apostle again. He never sent him back to say, go back and be a fisherman. That's all you're good for. He was so patient with these men. And to me, I find that very encouraging. I would like to think that that translates into God's patience for me as well. Do you ever feel frustrated because you're not progressing as rapidly as you should? Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I think I'm bad. Like when I'm sick and they give me a pill. Okay, I take the pill. I should be better now. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way. Yeah, and if we can transpose that image into our Christian life, sometimes we just think it shouldn't be this hard. And why am I, why am I a slow learner? Why am I having trouble doing what is right before me in black and white? Uh, Christian virtues, the, the fruit of the Spirit, at least collectively, if not individually, we could probably name all of them. Didn't did Paul struggle that? He says, what I don't want to do, I do. And what I do, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen? I like you have to read yeah, a lot of times. <coughs> I saw that all of this in Paul at some point. It's taken a long time to admit I got a wall. And I found to do, I got a path to go. And I turned around and said, okay, what do I put? What I in my own habit that's keeping me from getting closer to God. And once I get that, fear that out, and I get that, and, I, and it takes time to get that, to get that destruction out of the way, then I can go in progress. You feel like you've got a little second wind there. Yeah. That's a real good comment. What's the hardest aspect of Bible study for you? And I don't mean what book in particular or what section of scripture. Is it the is it the repetition of it? Is it the the need for perseverance? Is it the personal nature of it? Would you be okay if you just came and had somebody else to kind of spoon feed you? Is it is it rolling up your sleeves and not only the reading of the word but the actual studying of the word? That's what 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 would you say is your greatest challenge that we did? Oh, stay in the way while you're reading. For my immediate repetition of looking up so many scriptures says one thing to verify it for us. And we're already believers, you know, and we believe you. You're not going to lie. And, uh, but you do need to check me out. 
Genesis five scriptures that explain that, and that's repetitious. Can be a little tedious, can it? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't meaning to be mean with Dick, but he was just telling me he he wasn't going to fall asleep tonight because he didn't eat before he came. And then he said, you know, I fall asleep during award-winning movies. And he was telling me that to let me know that I shouldn't take it personally. <laughs> and I don't. I, sometimes I tell people, it's if you feel comfortable enough to sleep here, then that's OK. You know, I, I, there's not that I was thinking about you asked about why they chose the apostles. I think because Jesus read their heart and and uh, throughout the Bible it talks about being patient, humble, and the poor fishermen, they, you know, they can't, they don't stand up on a pedestal or anything. So uh, they're, they're starting right out from the get go. Yeah, it's not like they were, you know, had gone to school to be an apostle or anything. This is their school, but day one, they get called and they've never been down this road at all. They, they, they have enough knowledge, I think, at this point to know that there's something very different about this man, Jesus. They probably heard from John the Baptist about him and the the word must have been flying like crazy as to the greatness of Jesus and all that, and probably miracles and hearing him speak. So, I don't know, this is early in the ministry of Jesus, so you don't know how much they've heard, but they know something that they don't, they can't begin to fathom what's going to be involved. And next Sunday, we'll look at more details where it's not just uh, bread to feed yourself or it's not going to be simple obstacles. It's going to be things like, will you follow me to death? Steve? The biggest challenge I have when I'm reading study is being mindful of what it is I'm reading. Because after a while, sometimes, depend, depending on the passage or the section, sometimes my eyes will go on autopilot and my brain will start thinking about other things. And then I'll realize, oh, I've gotten like half a chapter or something. And a lot of times, I've been reading from Jeremiah lately, and there's a lot of times that's going to speed and stop back up and missing some of this. So you're and especially doing, because it's, especially when it starts getting a bit repetitive sometimes. So you're doing a little mental multitasking. Yeah. And then I realize I'm not really, I'm that I'm doing it just to do it, not to actually work. Yeah. There's probably quite a few people that envy that, that you can multitask with your brain. I think Jesus had that and uh, more about, about him drew people to him also. I think it, uh, he had that that he turned on and off when he wanted to also. But, uh, but uh, when people, thousands of people gathered to him, had, I think there was this aurora that, uh, that he showed and people just were drawn to it. Yeah, although I think sometimes, Don, we romanticize that maybe a little bit more than because when you read the prophecy of Isaiah 53, it, it, Isaiah says there was nothing about him that would cause people to, at least physically, when, he, when Jesus walked by, nobody, nobody was sitting there saying, my goodness, is that not a fine specimen of a human being? There, there, evidently, there was nothing like that to, that nothing like that kind of aura that put him on a pedestal that would, magnetize other people towards him, but maybe when he spoke. And, and I think, uh, as Dick hinted, he, not only did he know the hearts of the apostles, but boy, his heart was something else. And you could just see compassion and love uh, probably in every crease of the skin. I thought of it that way because of the uh, first apostles that uh, he collected on the seashore. Matthew and uh, all four of those say, why do they really just start with the thing just that would follow them? I mean, that's what it, there's something there. And, uh, yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't deny there was something great about that would make you want to follow somebody that you didn't know a whole lot. Debbie? 
I was just going to say on, on that. Maybe they saw the serenity and the peace within him. Because I picture the Jewish people as being, you know, the way they did things, they got a little carried away. <laughs> you know, that, that is a wonderful quality, isn't it? And this, this was a, draws you. a time of great calamity, but to be... I know people here that to, to me, I was drawn. To be, to have that kind of calmness and sense of serenity and coolness in the midst of such chaos, uh, that would be, that would be a very, very attractive thing to have with it. There was a, a period between the, the last writings of the Old Testament New Testament was what, 400 and some years? Yeah. And now Jesus comes along and, he, and his teachings start to really take hold. And that kind of generated some interest, I would think. Yeah. Because there were a lot of false prophets at the same time. What he was saying was unique. Yeah. Kind of set the stage, didn't it? There was a great anticipated patient fact that. Yeah, you remember it in that. Jesus, a young child, was teaching in the temple. Also, uh, all these teachers astounded by him. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> you got to take that into consideration. Well, all right, Don. I take it back. There was an aura about him. They were, they were. But I'm, I'm trying to reconcile the words of Isaiah. And yeah. Maybe Isaiah was just talking from a physical point of view. Jeannie? I think one of my favorite verses is uh, when Jesus. As uh, Peter, or maybe a little more broadly, more than just him, but will you go away also? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Only you have the words of life. Only you have the words of life. You know, Donna and I have talked about this a lot. And she brought me a book to read. Um, well, quite a few months ago now, maybe even a couple years ago. Um, but it talks about how um, human beings want to um, dig wells that won't hold water. You know, we, we, our jobs or our health or our families. Chasing after the wind. Only Jesus has the words of life. So, you know, you, we, as human beings, we try to find stuff to um, make us happy, make us satisfied, or whatever, but it, the, the only one, the only thing that, I think the way either the book said it or I've seen it written, he is the only river that will never run dry. Oh, that's good. A couple more comments here, and then we're gonna close. Uh, maybe as an illustration, today a few of us went to Red Lobster and they were having their crab fest, and I got what I always get, the fisherman's platter, because it's cheaper, and I don't want to eat all that much, but I couldn't resist getting some crab legs on the side. And I usually get the, the king crab. No, you get the snow crab. I get the snow crab. If you get them. The waitress, I said, okay, there's three kinds. Tell me about them. And she told me uh, the dungeons or whatever the they're the best. To, that's the tastiest. Fred, you might be able to tell on this. You're, you're a lobster specialist. But anyway, I decided, you know, I don't think I've ever got, I said, which one has the most meat? And she said, the king. And so I said, okay, give me the king. I had never gotten king crab. And they got, they're really prickly. They're really hard to, well, they bring you the little crackers and all that. But it was a, it was a, I'm trying to, I'm trying to answer the question, do you ever find, find Bible study really sometimes hard? But after you work your way through it, it's really delectable. It's really wonderful. And that was the kind, that's kind of, I remember years ago, we were dining with uh, the Jones. Angelo and Allison. Angelo and Allison. And I said, Angelo, you don't, you don't like crab legs? He said, no, I, I don't like the work. He said, I don't, I don't want to have to work for my food when I'm eating. And today I understood it. In fact, I kind of, 
Margie Pakovich, I gave her a big fat leg and I said, you can have, you can have two thirds of that if you will crack it for me. And it took her 10 minutes. And then she gave it all to me. I said, oh no. I said, you're giving the lion's share of it. But I was just thrilled at that point. I was tired of messing with me. Uh, but but it, isn't it wonderful sometimes when you really, you really get into a scripture and you don't have the first clue what it means, but you keep pushing and you keep uh, plotting your way through and then finally things begin to open up and you get a glimpse of what you didn't see before. And, and at that point, all of that elbow grease and all that sweat and, and that uh, effort to try to understand it, it, really, it really becomes sweet and dear to you. Trudy and Barney are Fred, and then we'll wrap. Sometimes I think that's where the other, um, I just lost it. All right, the, other, the, the other versions of Bibles, in our help. Days, yeah, you come across the verse and I'm thinking, what did they <laughs> say? <laughs> so I might go to the American or the Concordance or yeah, something. I think and then a little light goes off. That is one of the best things, and sometimes we don't take advantage of the modern study materials that we have, and that one's e easily accessible. A lot of times you can just punch a scripture into your Google, and it'll come up, and it'll almost automatically give it to you in about 12 different versions. And sometimes one version you can read, and you can just not give it at all, and then you read it in a different version or a different translation, and you say, that's what that means. All right, Fred, I've got a few more things. We'll carry those over to a later time. But uh, your last comment. The, when you said about the crowd, I said, now more of lobster, you know, because in Maine, that what I did was, you get there and you say you want lobster, you tell the guy you want two and a half pound lobster, you want to get the biggest and best you can get. When, and you, and you, you, it's just way too much. Okay. Two and a half pounds, they're old and they're tough, they're no good. You work so hard to get to it, but it's, it was no good. You get a pound and a quarter, and you, it's, it's excellent lobster. We gotta remember that. We gotta remember that. But you can't be greedy, you'll pay for it. <laughs> too much, and it, you know, it's scripture the same way. You try to grab too much of it, take too much to hey, it, great. and it's not great. Great application there. You know, yeah. It's sort of the same kind of application. Very, very good. Okay, thank you so much for your good input tonight. And Stephen, I know Don and Shirley commune, need to commune, and I think they're the only ones.